I was saying that uh, allow me just to reflect on our experiences from uh, IGAD pastoral uh, uh, areas. Though I know the, the coverage is uh, given as uh, East African region, but uh, the importance of this is that uh, uh, these pastoral areas uh, constitute 70% of IGAD region. And uh, they also are subjected to um, uh, extreme weather conditions. And so I feel giving this experience of C1 in this particular area will still give us a snippet of uh, the interaction between conflict and, and, and climate. Um, we from C1 would want to uh, think of this issue as uh, that we need to look at the interaction between climate and conflict from uh, both the broader perspective, which is uh, the situation as it is uh, being uh, arid and semi-arid land, and also on terms of the triggers of uh, which are short-term issues, which is basically the climate change with, when there's a drought or, or uh, flooding. Next. So uh, our argument uh, based on this data that I've said uh, is that we have two uh, sides of this uh, story. There is the one side where we have the climate change and then we have the other side where we have uh, the conflicts. And in between the two, uh, there are critical life-saving uh, needs. And this includes the need for food, for water, uh, for, for, for shelter and other social uh, um, uh, services. And uh, I was actually looking at uh, some recent data from uh, ICPAC and I got uh, from the food security and it indicated, I think that was for September, that up to 29.5 million people were food insecure. Now, what you need to be asking yourself is when this big number of people are food insecure, what do they do next? And so that actually for us is the critical conversation. It's not so much that there's a direct meeting point between con climate change and conflict, but there is, um, a very key interaction between the two. Next. And uh, so in, uh, in the need to, uh, to meet these uh, needs uh, that I've said, uh, food, uh, shelter, water, et cetera, people end up then uh, getting, uh, taking actions. And uh, when, when they, their needs are uh, affected, then people are either pooted from their areas of uh, domicile, the livestock are lost or the uh, crop failures, et cetera, et cetera. So basically it means that when there is a change uh, in climate, then these critical life needs get affected. And then of course people will react to be able to survive. It's very natural for human beings to do that. So when I was uh, preparing for this uh, uh, reflection, I had to look for some data. I wanted to see generally how uh, the climate and, uh, and, and conflict events would, uh, would, uh, would interact. And then I managed to uh, get hold of this uh, accurate data. And you can see from here that as uh, the trend going, you see that as the conflict events are uh, increasing, you also see that uh, there's also uh, climate cases are also going up. That, of course, we can further interrogate, but it already gives us an indication that there's a, a stronger interaction between uh, climate and uh, conflict. Next. Um, so uh, based on, uh, on, uh, on our observations and, and lessons we've learned, <clears throat> they are critical um, conflict triggers um, uh, in the region. And, and some of them, uh, I, would, I think there's uh, probably something here, but this would be more of uh, uh, the conflict the conflict related issues that uh, are uh, in the region. And some of the things we found out are the climate change, which is now becoming a bigger issue that as uh, we find the climate change, either floods or droughts, and recently we saw issues of, uh, of a de desert locust, which of course, have also a climate uh, related conversation on it, then a conflict are bound to happen because then uh, people's uh, livelihoods get affected. The other issue is on uh, uh, overuse of natural resources. There's uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, activities going on in some areas 
which then uh, is also a risk for, uh, uh, for, for, for violence, discovery of hydrocarbons uh, and, and, and minerals, where uh, this uh, oil or uh, minerals are being discovered in areas which are pastoral. So a lot of interests are starting to grow there, but also with it, also is the displacement of the population, which of course, again, is a, have some climate a conflict related uh, uh, concerns. Then the population is rising and uh, this has a bearing on how much uh, an ecosystem is able to hold. And that, of course, you can already see the linkages that are there. Then there's uh, the border contestations. And the two things that are important to mention here is uh, one, um, uh, that as the hydrocarbons are being discovered, then you realize that um, people start to lay claim on some of the areas that were before were seen to be communal. And uh, the change also in terms of uh, the land tenure system also has a bearing on this because then people are moving from what they would before call like a generalized uh, uh, area say to graze, but now it's like you now have to break it down into smaller quantities. Then we are also seeing uh, issues around commercialization of cattle rustling in these areas. The problem with this is that before uh, the, the cut rustling was commercialized, it was more of uh, livestock moving from uh, one area to the other. And so they stayed within the area. But now with the commercialization, it means when, it's, when the livestock is stolen, you never get it. So this of course also is affecting the, the, uh, uh, the wealth of the people who are in these areas because then now there's been no way to recover the animals that have been uh, lost. And finally, the militarization of conflicts. Uh, we are constantly now seeing a lot of use, use of uh, uh, the military, especially in recovery of, uh, of, of livestock. Next. So uh, this map basically uh, shows us uh, what we are, when we are talking about climate change and conflict, and this map we draw the, the data for, from uh, ICPAL and uh, ICPAC. And then, of course, we layer this with, uh, with, with our conflict data. And you can see, for example, the whole of uh, Turkana, you can see it's basically uh, dry. Basically, you know that the people who are there will be forced to move, not just, for example, the side of Uganda, but also the protected areas that are, uh, are, are forest, et cetera, because then you have to survive, therefore you have to do something. Uh, next. So this is what I was saying was a bit uh, switched in terms of titles. Uh, and so these uh, here are a number of issues that we picked as the triggers, the triggers of, uh, of uh, conflict. And again, the, the leading one would be persistent drought and, and, and flooding as, as an example, because now the region is experiencing frequent uh, droughts and flooding. And whenever that happens, the communities are forced to move. And they are not moving to an empty land. They are moving to places where people are, are, are resident, not just in terms of the, de the, de the destination, but also in terms of the areas that they are moving through. So this has been uh, coming out clearly as a, a key uh, conflict uh, a trigger. The other one is uh, migration or uh, population displacement. And uh, again, as a result of this uh, climate change, uh, population are forced to move. And as they are moving, as I've said, they are not moving across empty lands or into an empty space. And so whenever they move, and of course, remember, some of these areas, uh, the, the relationships are not as good as it should be. So that in itself creates opportunities for a, a clash between the communities. Then the foliage reduction. We've been, for example, making use of equal data as far as the, the vegetation cover is, uh, is, is concerned, they always anticipate, and of course they do happen, that conflict uh, would take place. Yes. And uh, then when there's drought, then people cry that there is a, uh, they cannot uh, survive. There is a, a vegetation uh, cover has increased, then of course there's conflict. And there are two reasons for this. One is that now there's a feeling that uh, livestock are uh, stronger and you can actually now uh, uh, 
system but also they can work uh, very fast towards climate change, uh, uh, climate change do increase uh, the risk of conflict and I've uh, said this, I don't really need to belabor this. I've also mentioned about the, the issue of the increase in vegetation, while it should be something that uh, should be positive, it also carries with it the negative element or being used negatively. Uh, but our assessment is that climate change really doesn't need to lead to conflict. And there are activities or interventions that can uh, would be able to prevent uh, the vulnerability of the communities. And we tried this with ICPAC at some point, I think in 2018, where we used the, the ICPAC uh, uh, climate outlook information, we downscaled it in Karamoja cluster, and then uh, bringing the communities together and the leadership were able to design response activities. And if you look at uh, in 2018, you realize that uh, the, the, the violence conflicts were relatively low. And the final lesson here is about uh, the instrumentality of uh, uh, intercommunal resource sharing agreements. And there are so many in these areas, but for them to, uh, uh, to be effective, the buy-in and support from the local governments is also very necessary. Next. So um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, how do we then uh, consider using uh, climate products and services. I have three, I know there can be many, but uh, here I just chose three. First is that C1 is currently having uh, um, early warning indicators that are of environmental nature. And so with the uh, uh, climate information, we should be able to continuously refine these uh, environmental indicators, and that will be able to help us uh, predict environment-related conflicts. Uh, the other, and I've mentioned about it, is about downscaling the, uh, the, the climate information. We are working together, different entities working together uh, to look at uh, the projected uh, weather and uh, working with the communities to be able to design the response that would be necessary. This has been done, it can be done, and it has the potential of uh, 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 supporting uh, many, many uh, communities. And finally, uh, I said our data is uh, as old as 18 years. We have 18 year of data on conflict. And also APAC has a lot of data. I believe if we were to look deep into these two databases, we should be able to really come up with uh, uh, some uh, uh, kind of a study that would uh, then uh, help us have a further conversation on the convergence between uh, climate change and then conflicts in the in the region. Next. So uh, in terms of conclusion, I think what I need to uh, just say here is that uh, from the C1 data, uh, we have preliminary evidence that shows that environmental indicators may actually serve as useful indicators uh, for not just organized raids and but generally violence in the region. But we believe, and as I said, that uh, uh, to address the climate change and uh, its nexus with, uh, with conflict and increase the community uh, resilience, a lot of focus needs to be put into the impact of climate change on social, environmental, and economic sectors. And use that information then to design a proper response, early response, or some call it early action, uh, mechanism. And this, as I said, uh, we've tried it, it works, but it needs uh, 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 further buy-in so that uh, the, the, the greater good can be uh, enjoyed by the, the communities that are uh, in these areas. I believe that uh, uh, I've gone probably beyond my time, so allow me to, to end here. I thank you for listening.